Encounters with Awe. This is Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. In 1980, an Aussie by the name of Tony Renato was in Africa on an impossible mission. His task was to grow trees in the desert. Transplanted saplings were supposed to root and become windbreaks, woodlots, maybe even forests. If successful, this reforestation was supposed to make farming viable once again in a vast, drought-stricken region called the Sahel. But the whole operation was beyond thankless. It was proving to be pointless. With his organization called SIM, Tony had been trucking in tree after doomed tree by the hundreds, day after day. But over previous decades, this region, the Sahel, had seen a 30% decrease in rainfall. We're talking about one of the most dramatic droughts of the 20th century. So if a desert repeatedly cooks your baby trees, how long do you just blithely keep planting them before you're willing to say, game over? It was failing. 80, 90% of the trees died. People didn't enjoy the work. They called me the crazy white farmer. Then one day, the crazy white farmer saw something that seemed almost too simple and certainly too good to be true. Hidden in plain view all along, albeit very low to the ground, lay a vital truth. In this episode of Constant Wonder, we'll get to hear Tony Renato revisit that epiphany. And just so you know that this whole story really matters, his sudden moment of recognition has led to what has been called probably the largest positive environmental transformation in the Sahel and perhaps all of Africa. But why stop there? The forest regenerating process that he has championed since his discovery has been adopted in 27 different countries and counting. Tony Renato is author of The Forest Underground, Hope for a Planet in Crisis. Today, he serves as Principal Climate Action Advisor for the humanitarian organization World Vision International. From the days of his childhood in Victoria, Australia, Tony Renato has been obsessed with trees and was curious why people seemed so intent on clearing them away. My grandparents were a 35-minute drive away. And as you leave our town, for the first 10 kilometers or so, the trees would extend from the top of the hills to the very edge of the road. Then at a certain point, you come up this rise and about to go down into the valley as it opens out. And bang, directly in front of me would be the Mamanji Ranges, bald as a baby's bottom. And I was just a child, but I'd be thinking, why did the farmers have to take every tree off that hill? And look at the erosion gullies, look at the sheep suffering in the hot sun. Surely it would have been better to leave some trees. And in my mind's eye, I was up on that hill in my gumboots, shovel in hand, planting trees. So I don't know where that comes from. As far as I know, there's no foresters in our family line, but I love trees. <laughs> Broad fields of tobacco, pine forests, and those denuded mountain ranges where the pulp industry had done extensive harvesting. These are the vistas that got young Tony daydreaming about planting trees. He describes himself as having been something of an oddball child, not inclined to sharing his feelings or talking about what he was observing. The Tony I got to know, as I think you'll come to see, isn't particularly introverted. Not anymore. I think that was a pretty lonely time for me. But, you know, my, my dad had a machinery business and he was very well known in the district. And one day we were visiting one of his friends. He was actually a, a Yugoslav migrant who escaped communism and made his way to Australia. And dad had helped him a little bit along the way. So we were visiting this farmer. It was off season. So his tobacco shed was completely empty. But in the middle of the shed, he unceremoniously dumped a whole trailer load of uh, clearance library books, old books. And I liked reading. I was very interested in history and geography, things of the world. And so I, I wandered over and took a closer look. And there were two nondescript, dull, green-covered books in there. And for some reason, it was like magnetism. I reached down and grabbed these books by Richard St. Barbie Baker. I planted trees 
and Sahara Conquest. And I borrowed those books and read them from cover to cover, maybe several times. And I was just wrapped by this story. St. Barbie Baker, he's as eccentric uh, as his name would suggest. So British forester, and, and I would say self-proclaimed global protector of the forest, he contributed to saving a portion of the Californian redwoods, for example. But he was a strong proponent of sustainable management of forests and restoration where forests had been lost. And so he was an inspiration, somebody to aspire to. And I thought, perhaps there is something that I can do in the world, because I, I really had no clue how to tackle these issues when the whole world seemed to be moving in a different direction. It's all about progress and wealth at any cost. Tony Renato and I are about the same age, and back when we were kids, the term tree hugger was bandied about, not in a good way. You may be thinking what I was, that Tony sounds like he may have been accused from time to time of being one himself. When I asked him about that label, he just took it at face value. People suspect I'm probably a tree hugger. You know, I've only done it two or three times in my life, and it, it is actually quite an experience. I'd highly recommend it. But it's not something that I do on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to take that boy experience and go back to the books. And I'm, I'm wondering if you were sort of primed by what you had seen to get through those books. And you say you were raptly attentive to what they offered you. At some point, this is actually kind of funneling you toward a life course, don't you think? Oh, definitely. And I like to say there's probably three significant things that shaped me and continues to this day. And, and so one was what we've already described, the destruction of that bushland, the natural environment that I loved. And along with that, I didn't mention that um, being a tobacco growing area, some pretty heavy chemicals were used to protect that crop. And back at that stage growing up, they sprayed DDT and other chemicals from aeroplanes. And in this area, tobacco farms are very small. So you've got this small turning circle and the spray drift would go into the rivers, the mountain streams that I loved. We swam there, we fished, we drank that water. It was being poisoned. So that, that was the first thing, that, that disregard for the environment. And then because I read widely, I watched the news, I was interested in world events, children just like me, who through no fault of their own happened to be born elsewhere, we're going to bed hungry. And, and this deeply disturbed me. <laughs> we were growing tobacco. Children didn't have food. A again, something wrong with this picture. Did you talk to your parents about any of this, these feelings? No, no, I was very private. And I actually found it hard to articulate what I was going through. I, was, I wasn't a good communicator. <laughs> so, it, yeah, it was lonely. But uh, the third thing was my mother's faith. And that gave me a framework to live by, that there's more to life, more important things than money and financial security, that we do have a duty of care for those less fortunate than ourselves, and that creation's a gift. We are to be stewards of the earth. So those three things really stuck with me. If there are gifts that we are given and creation is to be cared for, how did she convey that to you? Was it, was it verbally? Was it by things she did? Mum didn't preach to us. She certainly prayed with us at night. But I think the quiet example of her life. But, you know, at that stage, again, being frustrated, what, what could I do to change the world? I, I felt powerless. But there was one thing that I could do. And following mum's example, I just said a child's prayer. Please, God, use me somehow, somewhere to make a difference. And, and that, you know, simple prayer, and I see that as another very significant turning point. And as the years um, went by following that, well, how could I be useful? What what steps? And I love growing things. I was the gardener in the family. And, and dad had a big gardener, but he was very busy with his business. So I, I managed the garden. And so I thought, well, I better be useful. Let's study agriculture. And, and that was the first step, if you like. And when I went to university, that's where I met my lovely wife. And she had the same sense of calling, sense of duty. Yes, I, I'd like to be used by God overseas. One step at a time, you, you go as far as you can see. You don't know the full picture. You don't know how or when or where or what, 
But you go as far as you see, and when you get there, you'll always be able to see that much further and take the next step. Somewhere along the line, it would have been in the first year or so at university, I came across a book called Forest Farming, and it just made sense. You could have production, you could feed the world without destroying the earth. And he went back into history and how farming was developed. And he gave examples, particularly in Europe, some of the acorn forests where they graze pigs under the acorn trees and other examples of agroforestry. And I thought, yes, surely that must be part of the solution. College, a sense of purpose, marriage to Liz, a fellow student whose passionate concern for the well-being of the world and for children and for fields and forests was equal to his own. Well, those must have been fairly heady times. And I asked Tony if he could remember those early days together with Liz, launching out into the world with its possibilities and unknowns. You're just a young man on the cusp of a new life with a young bride. You're going to go to Africa. How would you describe that young man? You already said you were a shy boy reserved and maybe not able to communicate the way you wanted to. Was this a lodestar for you where you're really looking for a solution or the solutions in the plural to an enormously big global whopping problem called deforestation? That's kind of idealistic. So naive. Had no idea. I I didn't even know, I think, that I was looking for solutions. When the country of Niger was settled on, I felt that tree planting would be a big part of the approach that we took. But beyond that, I I didn't know that tree planting was a problem, that it didn't work in those harsh environments. I didn't have any idea really of the challenges of moving a young family to a very, very poor country. Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world. The climate, the diseases that are out there, the cultural differences, Uh, here's this non-communicator, I'm going to have to communicate in another language. (laughs) So I think if if you know ahead of time what's coming, you probably avoid it altogether, you wouldn't go. (laughs) I want to go back now in the sequence of events, before you even ever left Australia, what was the, the sort of the mental process for you and Liz leading to your decision to to go. Uh, Africa's a world away. No matter how you look at it, that's going to be a really big commitment. We were soulmates, and we were very much in love and still are, and we planned and schemed on how this would happen. When we finished university, we thought, let's get some experience in Australia. And and that way they, they couldn't accuse us of going over there to make our mistakes. And, you know, that year in Australia, for every agricultural job, there were about 400 applicants. So there was no way we were going to get into the industry. And we ended up working for my father in in his machinery shop for a year. And the longer we were there, we, we loved it. We loved being at home and so on. But this deep discouragement set in that we weren't moving with our life's goals I thought all all that dreaming, all that desire to do something significant is going nowhere quickly. And Liz is also very practical. She said, well, let's pray about it. And um, we prayed that night. And the next day, we subscribed to this magazine that came monthly. The next day, full page, middle spread, come to this conference on missions and agriculture. (laughs) It was like it was written for us. SIM, SIM, a decades-old international Christian service organization active in over 70 countries. Well, that's the outfit the Renatos signed up with to be missionaries. Obviously, they were hoping to support SIM's agricultural initiatives. And as a confirmed Johnny Appleseed type from his earliest days, Tony Renato, as we've heard him say, had also long been converted to the vision and spirit of Richard St. Barbie Baker the vision of bringing back trees, not just for the sake of trees, but because of everything that comes with them. In these contexts where there was a forest before, it turns out trees are very foundational. They bring back the biodiversity. It's like a magnet. Once you have a tree there, the bird life will come back, the insects. 
the trees themselves, many of these species are putting nitrogen back into the soil. They're, they're legumes, so they're fertilizing practically sterile soil. All tree species drop leaf litter onto the ground, adding organic matter. And organic matter is the secret source. It's the sponge that holds the water for longer and slowly releases it. It's the substrate that holds the nutrients, feeds the microorganisms that make those nutrients available to the plants. And so by default, the soil's more fertile, more moist, even in a harsh environment, and your crops are going to do better. Your livestock are going to do better, not just because there's more grass, but many, many tree species are also fodder species, the leaves, the seed pods. And in some cases, even the bark is very nutritious. And farmers will use the strip the bark in drought time. They'll cut branches and strip the bark to keep their animals alive. The trees themselves, and I didn't know this, some of these tree species are bio-irrigating the crop, meaning their deep tap roots are accessing water deep in the soil. And at night time, some of that moisture leaks into the ground via their shallow roots within reach of the crop roots. And it's astounding. I've got photos taken in total drought years. And 10, 15 metres from the base of the tree, there's nothing. The crops perished. The closer you get to the tree, the taller and greener and healthier the crop gets because it's being irrigated. Insects, so you've got your pollinators, you've got your predators attacking the different pests that come, the grasshoppers, the caterpillars, and so on. Medicines, wild foods. So no matter how well you restore the environment, these are still very, very harsh, volatile climates. And so you will get periods of drought and flood. The greater biodiversity you have, the more stability in the landscape and the more options people have for their livelihoods. Maybe my staple crop, maize or millet, maybe that dies in the drought, but I can now harvest wild fruit and nuts and feed my livestock. I can sell some of the timber and buy food with that money. So it's creating stability. Well, it sounds to me like all of this intricacy of the implications, the the whole system is something you came to appreciate maybe only after you had arrived there for and been there for a while. Oh, oh yes. Um, we knew it was important, but we had no idea how everything is so interlinked. The social, the economic, the environmental, everything's connected. And if I could just paint you a picture, it was hopeless. The project was hopeless. The potential for change was hopeless. We were confronted by a landscape on the point of ecological collapse, one that could barely support life on Earth. It was so denuded, so degraded. Several times in our uh, life there, there was total blackout because of a dust storm in the middle of the day. It, It was a real dust bowl experience. And I have dramatic photos, every bit the equal of some of those photos from your 1920s experiences, the the sand dunes rolling in over the people's villages and huts and people struggling. They're they're drawing water from the well and you can see their clothing, their loose clothing is blowing in the wind. They're covering their eyes. It was terrible. And in the space of just uh, 20 to 30 years prior to my coming, this had been a biodiverse dryland forest with wildlife. There were giraffes and various types of primates and uh, wild boar and so on. And there were springs of water and relatively fertile soil. Uh, For all intents and purposes, even though it was still farmland, it was a desert in in many respects when we arrived there. (laughs) And here's the, the resident expert, the guy with his degree and no experience, fix it. (laughs) Where where do you start? What do you do? (laughs) It just so happens I have heard dozens of experts talking about uh, the scope of what trees mean for landscape, for the water cycle, an ecosystem, for the human economy. But I don't think I've ever heard anyone on this topic cover so much ground so quickly and with such verve And yet even for him, he says, the environmental situation as he came to know it in Niger, perplexing, yes, 
But that wasn't all he was grappling with. He was perplexed also by the situation for his family, for him and Liz and their first child, Ben, a world away from home in a completely foreign environment. I don't think any crash course could have prepared them for the switch they were making. You become like babies because you can't communicate. You don't have the language. I hadn't shed my shyness, my difficulty of communicating even in English then. So the embarrassment of not being able to ask for basic things, directions, um, how do you do this, and being laughed at by children. Some people relish in bargaining, you know, get the price down. And, and of course, that's the culture. That's how the market works there. I, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it's just too, too overwhelming. And uh, so for the first months, Certain canned goods, certain dry goods had a fixed price. I'm not sure why they don't don't bargain on those things. And so we lived on rice and canned mackerel. <laughs> not three times a day, but it was getting close to that. And to this day, I, I haven't opened another can of that <laughs> mackerel. I can't stand the smell of it. But that was a challenge to get a diversity of foods. Not that it wasn't available to some degree, but just our shyness in going into the market. But it's actually a good thing to start low. If you come in as the expert, if you're already multilingual and capable, then there's a certain arrogance that goes with that. And I think you inoculate people to not listen to you because there's no vulnerability there. If you go in almost childlike, needing their help and have the humility to go along with that, the humility and humour to laugh, I remember one morning to say good morning. It's a slightly tonal language. and, and What is the language, by the way? Hausa, Hausa. So to say good morning, it's ina kwana. It's very melodic, ina kwana. And I was going around saying ina kwana, ina kwana. I am sleeping, I am sleeping, because everybody's in stitches laughing at you. If you got offended and, and stormed off, you'd never learn the language, but I'd laugh with them. Despite putting a good face on things, Tony ultimately could not avoid a deep slump. I would say that his frustration was inevitable. He had been retained to plant trees, but could planting those trees really make any difference at all in Niger as the desert swallowed up ever more farmland, turning it barren? We had a very small project, and I mean small. It was planting 4,000 to 6,000 trees per year, so it was just peanuts really. But even at that, it was failing. 80, 90% of the trees died. People didn't enjoy the work. They called me the crazy white farmer. Who in their right mind would plant trees on their precious farmland when they're trying to put food on the table? I respect that. I understand that. But I also knew, no, unless you do this, there will be no food. Agriculture is not possible in this climate without some level of tree cover. And, uh, you know, I read this more recently, but in the 10 years prior to my coming, uh, across three West African countries, including Niger, some $160 million was spent on tree planting. The net result of that was about 20,000 hectares of, and I, I quote, not doing very well plantation. So they were struggling, not doing very well. And if you do the maths, $8,000 per hectare of not doing very well forests. So that's a failure in my view. And when you consider, I think there's 300 million hectares across the Sahel, it would cost trillions of dollars using that method to do anything. If it was failing, and you and Liz were there trying to make it go, and you had a little kid named Ben, and uh, people were hungry around you, uh, that's a futile situation. How despondent, how discouraged did you become? Oh, I was very discouraged. You know, when you're young, you're very ambitious. I'd come there to leave my mark and everything I touched turned to dust. Everything was failing. So I, I was quite miserable and I'd put heart and soul into this. I'd read widely. I'd consulted any experts I could latch on to. I experimented with different methods, exotic species, indigenous species, planting early with some irrigation, different types of guarding. Nothing worked in a sustainable economically viable way. So I, I was ready to give up and go home. And how many years into it were you at this point? About two and a half years. Because, you know, I've been trying. These two and a half years, I've been trying, giving it everything that I had. 
did you consider leaving? Well, home was the only place I had, but I was probably too proud. <laughs> Imagine a you know, country boy returns home having achieved nothing. <laughs> so it was partly my pride that kept us there. The Renatos would stay in Africa for 17 years in total, but I can tell you here and now, in retrospect, there is little chance they would have stayed beyond their third year had it not been for that epiphany I hinted at earlier. And it's time now for that part of the story. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. The Forest Underground, Hope for a Planet in Crisis. That's the title of Tony Renato's book. At this point in our account, it's about 1983. Tony and his wife Liz are working as missionaries, their little boy Ben with them, giving their all to what you could variously call an agricultural initiative or a reforestation project, or even though the term was just coming into vogue at the time, agroforestry, Well, this tree planting project that Tony was in charge of was failing miserably. With his religious upbringing, he was the kind of person to hope for maybe a miracle, maybe even ask for one. Essentially all his life, after all, Tony had been the praying type. It was actually on the road, and I I had a, a truck and trailer load of trees, and it was a low point. So I was thinking, this is hopeless. I know what's going to happen to 90% of these trees. They're going to die. Now, I had to stop the vehicle because this was a very, very sandy region. And if you don't reduce the air pressure, you'll get bogged in the sand. And uh, I'm leaning over. I let the air pressure out. And as I stood up, I looked north and then turned around south, east, west, barely a tree, all the way to the horizon in every direction. And, you know, the cogs, mental cogs are turning. How many million dollars would you need? How many hundred staff? How many decades using these methods here? And immediately you know the answer. It's not going to work. You're not going to have an impact. And so this this is very, very discouraging. But it occurred to me to just just pray, just ask for guidance. And it's a little bit of a strange prayer in some ways because I actually ask for forgiveness Forgive us for destroying the gift of your creation. And it's not that I felt personally responsible for what was happening south of the Sahara, but growing up in the privileged West, I knew that all of us have had made our contribution through profligate waste and pollution and destruction of the natural environment for the cause of growth, economic growth. I knew that we weren't guilt-free. So it was an inclusive prayer. Forgive us for destroying the gift of your creation as a consequence of which people are suffering. They're hungry. They're poor. They're scared about tomorrow. They don't know what tomorrow will bring. But I reminded God, no, you still love us. Help us. Show us what to do. Open our eyes. And, And again, you know, a lot of people don't believe in prayer. A lot of prayers appear to go unanswered. But this was a very very real, very dramatic answer to prayer. And the amazing thing is I'd been traveling on this road almost weekly for two and a half years, eyes open but totally blind to the solution, to what had literally been there at my feet all along. And on this particular day, a useless-looking bush, I thought it was a desert bush, caught my attention, just the corner of my eye, maybe 10, 15 meters from where I was standing, And instead of jumping back in the truck and trundling off to my miserable work, I took the trouble to walk over and have a closer look. And in that instant, when I saw the leaf, and if you consider the trees even in your backyard, in your street, every tree has a signature. It's the the leaf. It's very distinctive. And it, it hit me. That's not a bush. That's not an agricultural weed. It's a tree and it's been cut down and it's re-sprouting. In that instant, all the dynamics changed. I'm not fighting the Sahara Desert. It's not a question of having a multi-million dollar budget or a miracle species of tree that can withstand goats and drought and people pulling them up. Everything changed in my approach. There were probably 
originally probably over 20, perhaps 30 species of trees in that area. The shrubs that I was seeing, there, there may be five or six dominant species. So a lot of them had been not only cut out, but grubbed out by the roots. But there was this remaining five or six species and they were ubiquitous. This is what got me so excited. I knew there were millions and millions of these so-called bushes just waiting to be liberated and, and become trees again. This is the crux. What Tony calls the forest underground is of zero use to me, to you, to Tony, to farmers in Niger or Uganda or East Timor, anywhere on the planet. No use until it re-sprouts. But this returning top growth must be approached with a specific method. Large trees they will rarely become without systematic selective pruning. The liberation of individual stumps, as Tony styled it, is a practice he has come to call not natural regeneration, but farmer-managed natural regeneration, FMNR. When you cut a tree that has this ability to re-sprout or coppice, you might get 30, 40, 50 stems from the same stump, all competing for space and light and nutrients and water. Now, if we did nothing and there was no damage from fire and cutting and livestock, if, if we did nothing, eventually, maybe in a decade or two, eventually a dominant lead will take over and it will become a tree again. We don't have two decades. These people are hungry today. They need cooking fuel today. How can we speed this up? Well, for a start, let's reduce the competition and cut it back. Ideally, perhaps a single stem, but remembering uh, wood is the economy here. The energy economy is wood, not oil. People are going to harvest that single stem. So let's reduce it down to five stems, cut out all the excess, the weak, the broken, the crooked, select just the very robust, the straightest, the tallest, and favour them. All that energy in the roots, and I, I liken it to a V8 engine, it's it's switched on, but when, when you're not doing this, it's not in gear. It's got all that pent-up energy, but it can't move. Put it in gear by cutting the competition, reducing the side branches so that all, all the sugars go to the growing tip. Then you can get very, very rapid growth and a better form of tree. That's on the individual stem. And then let's look at the landscape. So what's the context? What's the objective of the farmer? If it's on agricultural land, they won't want to forest there. They still have to eat. So they will select the trees that are synergistic, their their companion plants to their crops, the ones that cast light shade, that fertilize the soil, that stop the wind, that feed their animals. They're not going to give you a biodiverse forest on their good land. A pastoralist on their grazing land might make a different selection of species. And the same principles work in a degraded forest. But in that case, we can approximate, we can recreate a natural biodiverse forest to the degree possible by allowing everything to come back. Prior to the implementation of this method, the common practice, and you would say a very flawed practice, was burning, clear cutting, stripping away the entire tree for firewood leaving it with these little ineffectual stumpy shrubs. Yes, the, the sentiment was that a clean farmer was a good farmer. And this was reinforced by Western thought with, with colonialism. They wanted to modernize agriculture and bring in steel plows, all, all for a good cause, increase production and incomes. But it, it was on a false foundation of destroying nature. Tony's next challenge was going to be to persuade anybody that his idea would really pan out. There were so many farmers in the region who were skeptical. You have to remember, the very same guy now pushing this pruning of shrubs was the crazy white farmer who had given his heart and soul to a failed campaign of planting trees. This is where the story has a bit of an ironic twist because farmers who were resistant to the idea were more easily won over precisely because the initial trial runs they were asked to do coincided with a time of historic famine. We're going to have to explain that.
I'm Marcus Smith. You're listening to Constant Wonder. Every year, as we approached the time of the rainy season, my heart was in my throat. You would look to the steel gray skies, hoping against hope it would rain, never being certain that you would get a crop that year. And people were already living on the edge. It wasn't as if they had a reserve to fall back on. Every year could have been a failure because this is a very um, unreliable climatic area. It's, It's naturally variable. So I knew that this could happen at any time and, and would happen. It had happened in the 1970s, the very severe Sahelian drought that killed many, many people. And it was more than likely to happen again. And I come to an understanding that people were relying on an annual crop in an environment biased against it. Anything could and eventually would go wrong. A severe windstorm that buried and sandblasted that crop, a severe drought, even excessively heavy rain, insect attack, you name it. If you're relying on this single annual crop, you've only got one shot for the whole year's food supply. And if you lose that opportunity, you know, the the rainy season doesn't wait for you. It doesn't come again in the same year. Even during a mega drought that doesn't relent for years, there are certain years that are going to be worse than others, which brings us to 1984. West Africa experiencing a famine that some have described as apocalyptic that year. Tony and his family were there in the interest of agriculture and trees, but people were starving around them. The SIM organization at this time wanted to adjust its functions to fund and distribute food. But that required government authorization, and that authorization was not forthcoming. Because the mission prior to my time in the 1970s, they had done some level of food distribution. So there was an expectation there. We were short of food again, and they started camping outside of my home. And and this was very distressing, Uh, perhaps more so for my colleagues, because I I would be out and about looking, trying to get money, trying to get food for the program. I didn't have the 24-7 burden of people on my doorstep, but they were certainly there in the morning waiting for me, just begging and and grabbing hold of my shirt, trying to get my attention, all talking at once. But I I tried to push through and I wasn't getting anywhere. Unbeknown to me, little Ben, and was he uh, three, four years old at that stage? Just old enough that he was bilingual, learning English and Hausa at the same time. This booming little voice calls out from behind me, Barashi Yawuchi, Bakushi Babaya Da Vinci. Let him go through. Didn't you hear him? He hasn't got any food. And the crowd were as as astounded as I was and parted (laughs) and let me through. But little Ben, he he was frustrated for his dad that he wanted to help them. He was trying to get help and they weren't letting him. Let him go through. (laughs) By this stage, I'd been in the country two and a half years. I'd slept in their villages and eaten their food and I'd reciprocated when they came to town. They stayed at my place. And so these were my friends and they were deeply hurting, they were leaving home, their children were suffering, and I I wasn't able to help them. And and one morning, I I woke up early, I'm in in the habit of doing that, and I was trying to eat breakfast and feeling really, really sad, and a, a lump was forming in my throat and tears were coming to my eyes, but the Bible was open just next to me, just randomly open, and my eyes fell on this passage from Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, I think it's uh, chapter 20, verse 15, Fear not and be not dismayed by this great multitude. And there was certainly a great multitude outside my door. For the battle is not yours, but mine, says the Lord. And I had this deep sense of peace come over me. I I didn't know what or how or when, but I knew that something very dramatic was going to happen. And, you know, up until that point, I had no money. We were just a small organization. I, I didn't have any reserve funds. I'd gone from uh, merchant to merchant. Maradi, the city that I lived in, is a major trading city on the border. No grain. It's just a mystery. And as expatriates, you can't just do your own thing. I needed permission, authorization. The standing premier, or you'd call them governor, 
of that state wasn't interested in giving that permission to us, but I knew God was going to do something dramatic. Within two weeks of reading that passage, that governor died. Now, I, I'm quick to add, I didn't pray for that. I, I prayed for a promotion, for a transfer, but the poor guy got the big call. And I, I was actually I was actually sharing my amazement to a friend because we got the permission almost immediately after that. And I said, red tape, these things don't happen so quickly. And my friend, he was from California, actually, Joel. Joel said, are you kidding? He was probably scared you'd pray for him too. <laughs> so I got the permission over the next six months through SIM and a small gift from USAID, we received half a million dollars. Grain mysteriously appeared. We purchased 1,800 tonnes of grain and helped over 30,000 people. And we were able to transform a tragedy and, and bring good, some semblance of good from bad. Let's not waste a tragedy, not in a crass way. We'll help them by all means, but let's bring some good out of this. And we created a food for work program so that able-bodied people were obliged before the monthly food distribution, they needed to protect and uh, regenerate at least 40 trees per hectare on their land. So it gave us an audience across 100 villages. Tony was suddenly able to offer a powerful incentive for farmers who were willing to try out his principles of farmer-managed natural regeneration. But still, pruning shrubs was seen as very strange behavior. So you're going against tradition in a very traditional society where conforming is what keeps things together. People look out for each other and um, belonging to the tribe, to the village is so, so important. And anybody who dares to be different uh, can suffer ostracism, criticism, ridicule even, and, and that's what happened. I, I went around to the different villages that we worked in and asked for volunteers. And at the end of that, I, I came up with 10 or 12 individuals in as many villages. And the approach I took was, would you experiment with me on a small corner of your land? They're your trees, it's your land. If it doesn't work for you, you have full authority to cut them out if that's what you see is necessary. But if it does work, we'll continue the experiment together. I'm hoping you could tell me one single story about one individual, somebody you you might even remember their name or their face, where somebody was perhaps skeptical to begin with and eventually came around. You know, we all have hangers-on, people who follow you and, and feign friendship, but really they want something out of you. And th there was a fellow like that in one of the villages and th they actually called him my, in French, chef de cabinet, my, my chief of staff almost, even though he had no formal position in my project. But that, that was the nature of the guy, he just followed me around. And as, as much to utilise his energy I, I took him on as a volunteer. During famine time, in each village, we had a number of volunteers who were promoting the regeneration work. Now, he didn't believe a scrap of what I was saying. He thought it was a crazy idea. Who in their right mind would allow trees to regrow on their land when they're trying to grow food? But he knew, he knew my character. He knew that one day I would come and visit his farm because I expected all of my paid staff and the volunteers to practice what they preach. And in this case, that would mean if we're telling, if we're asking villagers to leave 40 trees per hectare, then when Tony comes to your farm, he would expect to see 40 trees per hectare on your own land. Now, he's a little bit of a, a cunning fellow and he thought, well, I'm just going to carve out a small area of my land and that'll be the Tony visit site. But for the bulk of my land, I'm not going to put trees on them. That's crazy. Anyhow, this particular year, it, it was a, a drought year to start. So the crops were struggling. But in addition, there was a locust plague. And he noticed wherever there were no trees, the locusts had wiped out 
his crop. They'd completely eaten it out. But in this small tony patch, the small group of trees that he'd left to appease me, the crop was thriving, no damage. And this really puzzled him. So he, he took the time to sit under the tree, and which, which in itself, when you think of it, 40 degrees Celsius outside in the sun, nowhere to rest after you've been cultivating and so on. The, the very fact of having shade was a big improvement on his land. But as he sat there, lizards would come out of the tree every time a locust landed on the food plants, the, the millet. Lizards would come out of the tree grab that locust and then dart back for cover into the tree. And he said, aha, perhaps Tony wasn't so crazy after all. And he became a genuine advocate from that point on. <laughs> you know, I almost hate to even bring up this metaphor that for almost two decades there in Niger, you you were planting a seed because the method actually bypasses that whole trick of germination or even propagation of saplings, cuttings, that sort of thing. Uh, but just go with me here. <laughs> just work with me. You did figuratively plant a seed before you left, and that seed would bear fruit exponentially. Seems to me that you're really fortunate that FMNR didn't end right there in Niger. It went, it went elsewhere. At the time that we left, and, and bear in mind, I, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, we left certainly knowing that we had a localized impact in a hundred or so villages that I worked in. What we didn't know is that this spread organically, and if you'll excuse the phrase in this post-COVID era, virally across that nation at a rate of a quarter of a million hectares per year for 20 years. So uh, uh, from, from 1984, when we made this discovery of the underground forest, through 20 years later, 200 million trees were regenerated. So not, not a single one of them planted across 5 million hectares. It was very, very significant. Other countries will say, well, you know, we, we can't do this. And then you say, really? Is your situation harder than Niger? <laughs> if they can do it there, surely we can achieve something where you are. And more often than not, it should be easier and faster where you are because conditions are quite that bad. I have to ask you if this method of selective pruning and then waiting for nature to do its thing, is it a little embarrassing that it's so simple? Shouldn't we have something that happened, you know, with a bunch of complex science behind it? Well, you know, some would say if it's too good to be true, it can't be true, it mustn't be true. And I think the, again, maybe it's a Western thing that we, we feel if something as complex and long-standing and difficult as desertification, to, to address that, we must need an expensive, uh, sophisticated solution. That, that's our mindset. This method is simple, embarrassingly simple. It's not even new. I didn't invent it. It's a, a traditional method that is intuitive and historical. I certainly promoted it. I'm not embarrassed because it actually works. It works rapidly, it works at low cost, and it works at scale. So no embarrassment. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> and if, if you would allow me to go to another level, yes, I love the green. Yes, I love the natural restoration. But what surprised me. I think in the West, we come to problems with a technical mindset. There's something very, very human happening here. And I call it the restoration of hope. Because people who could not feed or clothe or educate their children now have agency. By working with nature instead of destroying it, we can now create the future that we want. And I'm cracking up a bit here, I get very, this is powerful stuff. We can create the future that we want for our children instead of suffering, instead of being victims. No, we can do something about our situation. This is really, really powerful beyond, yes, of course, environment's important, but it goes beyond that. Tony, I hope this is a fair question, but I'm wondering if you can put your finger on just sort of a, a summation, something 
a fundamental aspect of all of this that has particular meaning for you? Yeah, just think of my situation where I was struggling for a solution for two and a half years. It was at my feet the whole time. I was rushing past these useless looking bushes, not noticing them, trying to solve the solution. And as, as if they were begging for me, please stop, please take a closer look. Smell the roses in a sense. And I was too busy, too much of a hurry to see what the landscape, what nature was saying all along. Few people ever have a story to tell like this guy does. An eye-opening moment of recognition. It results in the betterment of farming practices and communities in various places around the globe. But I think one of the happiest parts of his story, and it's actually an aspect that Tony Renato himself is very keen on, well, it's the fact that his understanding of the forest that can often be found underground has not turned into his own intellectual property for profit. He simply stuck to an idea, the idea sprang loose, it took hold elsewhere, and it has had its own life from country to country with local farmers as the drivers, and that's exactly the way Tony wants it to be. Our guest today, Tony Renato, is author of The Forest Underground, Hope for a Planet in Crisis. Tony serves as Principal Climate Action Advisor for the humanitarian organization World Vision International. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is the Constant Wonder Podcast. This episode produced by Tenery Taylor, assisted by Daniel McDonald and Jenea Tanner. Sound design by Josh Cloward, Addy Mangum, and Parker Schmidt, all from the BYU Broadcasting Sound Design Team. If you like what you hear, we would love for you to help other people find Constant Wonder. Leave us a five-star review or a comment in your podcast platform. And in the spirit of Tony's last thought, small things shouldn't be overlooked. It's really a small, simple thing you might do for us, but it goes a long way with the potential for really making a difference in the world. Thanks for listening. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.